What's up, everybody? It's Matt Johnson. We are back with another episode of Real Estate Uncensored. This is the place to get actionable ideas, insight, and inspiration to turn your real estate career into a life of freedom. Uh, we have no guests today, so we are taking your questions both on the Facebook group and live. So if you're watching uh, with us here right on Facebook, as we are every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific, you can get your questions answered directly, so be sure to put them in the comments below. And also just let us know that you're here. Um, let us know where you're listening or watching in from, uh, throw your comments in, let, let us know what you're, uh, what you're working on right now. Uh, we're going to take some questions on sales and marketing, how to deal with cash buyers, uh, what people are looking for in listing. And then the NAR just put out a very interesting study with some stats about the, uh, the businesses, quote, quote unquote, businesses of real estate agents. So we'll uh, delve into some of the more amusing statistics there. Cool. And uh, the junior grandmaster is in his uh, co-pilot seat where he so belongs, right in your box. I'm back Greg in my box. Daniel, what's up today? What up, man? Yeah, man, I'm back in the box. We had a holiday weekend this last weekend, and I was in Witsec, uh, in a non-disclosed location, a.k.a. San Francisco, um, and just having a, had a great time over there. What a great weekend. Um, went for a cool walk, like a really cool walk. Got some just amazing panoramic views of San Francisco from this little, little, little um, hill that we kind of perched on and had a beer or two and just kind of sat there and chatted and looked at this insane view. It was like unreal. It's like coast to the left you know like inner san francisco dead ahead of us and then the downtown like the, the the whole high the skyline down there with all the big major buildings the salesforce building which that is a massive building i mean it is, it is a massive building and actually i found out the other day that uh, i was at a giants game and i <clears throat> looked up at the at the at the salesforce building and uh up in the very very top of the building uh they they have this animatronic you know images that are in there and looks like people are dancing you know, you know, up in the very, very top. It's really cool. It's really, really cool. But anyway, yeah, just a good weekend. Now we're here on our show. We got some great Q and A, uh, and some of the questions that you were talking about, some of the highlights. <laughs> One of the things I just kind of chuckled to myself as you know, because we always, you know, people always always make fun of real estate agents a little bit and, and kind of the demographics of them. And I cannot wait to jump in into some of this stuff because I'm just chuckling away at. <laughs> these stats are pretty funny. I mean, the uh, income levels. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, well, not everybody lives in an area where one deal is uh, the the income of somebody else for a year. Um, True. Okay. So, uh, so first of all, Susan, <laughs> Susan's watching. Says we got to stop meeting like this, guys. I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> she was she was watching my last uh, my other live broadcast with Greg Harrelson leading up to this one. And then, guys, Manny De Silvia. We got Michael Higdon, Josh, Brian, Carl. Soon, what is up, guys? Arne is watching. Thank you so much, guys, for jumping on and and hanging out with us here. Jeff Scott was up. So we got a bunch of stuff to get into. First of all, this question caught my eye. This is from Don Tomlinson on the Lead Gen Scription Objections Group. Says, I'm curious, how do you weed out, quote, cash buyers who are really just people who can't or won't get pre-qualified for a mortgage but still want you to show them houses? Ever run into that? Or is nope. the $1.3 million price tag in your area uh, weed that out a bit? Yeah, I mean, if they're cash buyers, I have no problem with them being cash buyers. I'm just saying, if you guys are going to be paying cash and you're not going to get pre-qualified, no problem. Just show me a bank statement or an asset statement. I don't need to see numbers. I just need to see numbers. I don't see count numbers. I just need to see numbers that are in there. Otherwise, you know what? Because the reason why I make people do this, and sometimes people say, well, isn't that kind of rude to make them do that? And yeah, I can understand how you could how people could see that. But uh, I I've been led around by the nose uh, a couple of times in my earlier years by people who claimed air quotes to have the money to buy stuff when they were just tire kickers. Then they just wanted to they just wanted to feel really special and be and to be shown really nice houses. So one time of that happening, I'm like, you know what? Screw that shit. I am not doing that again. I'm gonna protect my time, protect everything else. You, you, you got the money, man. You're not gonna have a problem showing me the money. Because if you want to buy it, you can buy it. I mean, if you got that kind of cash, it's not a problem. So I don't really, I don't really run into that anymore. You know. Okay. So it's just it, it's a simple question, and it's the confidence to ask it and the willingness to walk away. Yeah, because if think about it, I mean, if they are, if they're, if they do have the money, then they have no problem showing you. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't, then they're going to make you some lame ass excuse of like, well, you know, I can't because I can't do this. Or blah blah blah. I'm like, look, bro. Get me a, an, an officer at the bank on, on letterhead from the bank stating the fact that you have the funds. That's the same as a pre-approval. I mean, why wouldn't – come on. Don't waste my time. Would you actually put that into the offer? Oh, yeah. When you submit a cash offer, what what are they – what what strengthens a cash offer? You need to see bank statements. It's just like so, – I mean, so Yeah, so it's not – you're not asking for anything that you don't need in, yeah. to make an offer anyway. You're just asking for it. Before we start looking at houses, yeah. <laughs> up front, yeah, exactly. Because, yeah. I, mean, I mean, if I was a listing agent and you brought me a buyer and said, oh, my guy's all cash. Oh, that's great. Where the fuck's the money? 
Oh yeah. no, my guy's good for it. Mm. How do you know mm -hmm. that? Oh, mm. because he said he was. No, yeah, no, no, exactly. no, 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 no. I wouldn't take that nice deal. Guy. Yeah, I'm just one nice dude. No. All it's right. Full of mirtha. Now this is a, this is a funny one. This is actually from Aaron Wittenstein himself. He was, uh, I guess, he had a, an interesting call the other day with an expired listing. So the homeowner claims that they're they're not going to list with him. I read this. Okay. I read this. And this is actually claims. Funny. I know. <laughs> claims it's because she wants a quote local agent, but then refers Aaron to her neighbor, <laughs> presumably to list her home, but not her own home. Yeah. So I got a kick out of that. First of all, Aaron, we feel for you because it sounds just wildly irrational. Um, but it, but it does it does uncover a bigger point, which is and I was talking about this with with Jared James uh, on the the other podcast earlier today, uh, and he shared that you know with with all the people finding agents online or finding them on social media and things like that. So do you know what the number one thing that determines whether they actually list your home with you or not? The one the number one thing they're looking for hmm. local market knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting, right? Well, with local market knowledge, I mean, even if you're brand new in the business, you can totally fake that. Mm -hmm. um, all you have to do is just go or to you and can have it. Or you can have it. If you're new in the business, if you you, you need to have it, yes. Yeah, yeah. You have the it factor. Um, uh -huh. But I mean, go to, you know, realtytimes.com. Go and read up some articles, kind of sound like you really know what you're doing. Go to neighborhoodscout.com, type in that zip code they're in, read some hyper-local stats on the demographics, you know, the modes of transportation, the types of, you know, professions, you know, just get knowledgeable about it and just talk as if you know about it. I mean, you're easy to, it's easy to do. It'll take you 20, 30 minutes, take a little cheat sheet into the listing appointment with you. If you have to write down some stats on a yellow pad, and refer back to it, look like you're looking over stats about the neighborhood when you're just looking at stats about, uh, shit. So there's 72.3% uh, African Americans, 11.2% uh, you know, in, in white people. And yeah, you're not gonna sound that intelligent if you do it that way. But if you flow and you practice it a little bit, you'll come off very clean and smooth and polished. Um, and you, and it's also just good information to have. You should be aware of this information no matter what. Okay. So start learning, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and yes, and I, I have one thing to add to that, which is if you are new to the business or new to the area, you can always get around that objection. And it, obviously best to have this in your pocket in advance, but um, if, if it's something that you feel like is going to be an objection, or if you're hearing it from other agents that this is an objection they get in a certain area or something like that, you can always arrange to just co-list with a broker or find someone that'll be your mentor, quote unquote, on the deal in exchange for 10% of the commission or something like that. There's plenty of other older agents who know how to run deals who aren't busy doing deals because they are busy sitting in the office and they would be more than happy to take a percentage of a commission in exchange for just making sure that the deal goes down well, mm -hmm. making sure that you get a price right, you know, contributing what they know about the area that comes from 30 years of knowledge or whatever. I mean, there's always ways around that. Um, <clears throat> and that's another good way to, uh, to borrow somebody else's credibility in any situation, any listing situation, is to say, hey, like I know, I know Mr. Seller, I never listed a $2 million home before, which is exactly why I've partnered with so-and-so mm -hmm. who has listed $2 million homes before, I'm going to bring the energy and the social media part. They're going to bring the old school networking kind of, you know, on the boots, on the ground, on, you know, boots on the ground knowledge part. And we're going to list this thing together and get it sold. Um, I mean, the Playboy Mansion was sold that way. It was co-listed yeah. by two brokers. So it's not like this is not, uh, un, unheard of. So uh, yeah. a couple a couple of different ways to get around that. <clears throat> Yeah, and that was a hundred million dollar deal. I mean, that's a that's a that's a big dollar that's a big ticket deal right there. Well, actually, that brings up a good question because um, so this is from uh, this is from Matt it says are are any teams doing a reduced or a flat fee or reduced commission on uh, on closing contracts for FISBOs that have a buyer under contract? Um, and if so, what does that look like? Because uh, I'm I'm guessing the Playboy Mansion was not sold to seven percent full commission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, what I'm saying a hundred million dollar deal. No, nobody's that insane. Um, no. So so somebody's cutting their commission somewhere. So that that's what reminded me of this question. But let let me read it again, just because it's it's interesting. Are any teams doing a flat fee or reduced commission on closing contracts for FISBOs that have a buyer under contract? I think what he's asking is if you encounter a FISBO who has a buyer interested already and they right. want to work with you just to handle the paperwork, do you cut your fee? To me, that would be a no-brainer. That's essentially them handing yes. you free money, so why not? Yeah, just say, okay, yeah, what do you, they charge, let's say it's just 3% for your side. They'll say, do it for 15 to 2%, which, okay, no problem. I didn't have to do anything, and I just get handed a full deal. All right, no problem mm -hmm. there. 
I mean, yeah. I've been toying with the idea of doing kind of like Garrick Evans had talked about Matt a long time ago on the show, um, uh, with in regards to um, you know doing the, the escalation on your fees. So you can either be the DIY program, the one percent listing program, which basically it's just I'll put in the MLS, I'll negotiate, and that's it. I mean, that's I, I don't waste any other time. And a lot of people question me when I when I talk about this, and they're like, "Why would you ever reduce your commission?" I'm like, "Well, no, it's not reducing my commission. It's reducing reducing my time on on, on on that I have to work. If I don't have to do anything except for have a couple of phone calls and negotiate with a buyer's agent, and then I guess get paid, and they pay for everything else and do everything else on their own, my dollar per hour value skyrockets. I mean, absolutely skyrockets. So why not have 21 percent 21 percent listings out there?" that you just don't have to do shit on. And then if they want you to step up your game a little bit, you will, but so will your compensation. I mean, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any, I don't, if the big guys are gonna be doing this, why can't we be playing in the same game if, if that's the way the, the, the cookie's gonna crumble? And, yeah. you know, Derek always said that nobody ever took the 1% listing. Everyone always looked, took the, the full price commission because you got so much more for your money. People just need to see what they get for their money. That's all it comes down to. Because yeah, I mean, I we have a listing, uh, I think we're going to be taking uh, Tiffany and I, my co-host on the radio show, we got a call from a guy who listened to us all the way in Florida, listened to us on the radio, she, yeah, listened to us on iHeartRadio, called to say, hey, I like you guys, I want you guys to list my house. We're like, okay, how much is it? 1.7, 1.8, uh, mm -hmm. yes, sir. He's going to whittle us down on commission, but that's mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I'm going to go over the whole thing about what he gets. We've already sent a whole breakdown to him, and he's like, oh, okay, I totally get it now. I'll pay this commission. And, because you, I get. and you're co-listing with a broker in Florida, I'm assuming, right? No, 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 no. He, he's the owner. He's just the owner. Okay. He's the owner out there, but he heard us because he used to live here in Fremont in the, in the gotcha. South Bay. Um, and, you know, usually I wouldn't go all the way down to Fremont to list a house, but $1.8 mm -hmm. million dollars when all the homes around it are selling for the same amount? Okay. Oh, I mean, he listens to you in Florida, but his house is in, is in like, right down, the, right down the road from you. Okay. Yeah, right, exactly. That makes sense. I was yeah, yeah, yeah. Two million dollar home in Florida. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we got a couple of comments I wanted to, to bring up here. So, uh, first of all, Mon Monica Weekly says, when you hit an objection, be, be sure to first ask why is that important to you, and that often heads off a lot of things. And the, and she's exactly right about that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, getting to like the hey, are you the you know, are you the local expert? You know, how many homes have you sold in this area? Yeah, starting off with well, why is that important to you? It essentially, gets them to usually drill down into something else that you can then deal with, which is because that's, that's never, that's never the real thing they want. It's, it's no. just what they think is the vehicle to get what they want, which is a better experience, a better sales price, whatever. Uh, but Jeff Scott has an interesting comment. He says, I've got it drilled in that I cannot comment about race or schools or anything else people uh, want. So Greg, what's your, um, you know, we're, we're kind of living in an interesting age where we've got, you know, like the HUD just brought a complaint against Facebook because you could essentially target ads according to gender and race and all these different things. Definitely and so they got, so, yeah. they got those targeting options removed and things like that for now. We'll see. But we're kind of in an era where you can do a lot of things with marketing that governments would not like you to be able to do. Uh, and there's so. a lot of big data out there on things that the government would not like you to talk about, which mm -hmm. things like race and ethnicity and how, how good or bad the schools are, for example. Uh, so where, where do you, just for yourself, where do you draw the line on what you talk about publicly, like on video when you're talking about a certain area? Uh, I, I, I don't, there's nothing wrong about stating facts about an area. Okay. Okay. They are, they are, they are factually based. So if I say all the black people live here, all the Mexican people live here, all the white people live here, all the Indian people live here, I'm not being okay. racist. I'm saying this is a fact. Go walk and see for yourself. I mean, the African-American population, there's a high density in Oakland. There's a high density of Indians and Asians in the South Bay. There's a high density of Caucasians here in the East Bay. It is just where people congregate. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying one area is better than the other. It's just what area do you, would you feel comfortable living in? Right. Because it's an education that I'm giving people. That's all. It's nothing more, nothing less. It's like, hey, hey, Matt, you're a white dude. Cool, man. Would you like to live in Oakland, the South Bay? Would you like to live out here in the East Bay? Would do any of these make sense? Or would you like to maybe live in the city or Marin? What What is your st style of life that you want to live? Man, right. I love the inner city. I don't want to pay for this for for San Francisco, but I'll, I'll totally move into Oakland. Okay, cool. You made a decision on where you want to live. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. 
-hmm. Absolutely. And if you're going to be big, a big of a pussy to not give your clients the information that they need, then, dude, seriously, you grow a pair of balls. <laughs> Uh, which is also what I would need if I decided to go live in Oakland, incidentally. <laughs> yes, you uh, would. Let's talk about this, <laughs> about this study. Um, so this is the uh, highlights from the NAR member profile, National Association of Realtors, for anybody who's not familiar, which you should be. Um, so uh, there are some interesting things. The typical realtor has 10 years of experience. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how many we're talking to on the show, because a lot of the people that listened and watched the show are, are less experienced than that. But that's the average, apparently. Right. Um, this is a cool, interesting, interesting one. Yeah, look at this. Uh, well, I'm sorry, what are you thinking, 80% what? 80% uh, of realtors were very certain they would remain active as a real estate professional for two more years. First of all, that's probably way unrealistically high, but I do think it's funny that already 20% of realtors don't think they're going to be active two years from now. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations, guys. One out of every five competitors you have don't actually expect to be in the business more than two years from now. How's yes, that? they will be out. No worry. No, you don't have to sit there and worry about them. This is a funny one. You know, uh, most realtors uh, work 40 hours per week in 2017, a trend that continues for, the, for several years. I mean, if you're only working 40 hours, I remember my first part-time job too. That's that's nice. Um, I, I mean, I was talking to who was I talking to? Um, oh, it was a, a gentleman that I was talking to the other day that runs a brokerage in in Florida, yeah. and uh, he was talking about how he's having to put out fires all day yesterday because he's like, hey, yeah, agents show up after the holiday, and then they realize, oh, there's work. Like I have work. The work work needs to be done, and so there's all these questions. And uh, we we're just joking around about how, you know, the Labor Day essentially turned into a four slash five day weekend for most of the people in the office. Because <laughs> if you got a Monday off, well, you know, no sense in sticking around on Friday. I mean, and why, wow. and why would you really roll in on a Friday morning? Nobody's going to be there except the coffee maker. So might as well take <laughs> off Thursday afternoon. So all of a sudden one one day off becomes five. Well, I mean, then then why not just kick it on over and just, and just kind of cruise through that Tuesday? I mean, get yeah. back to a solid Wednesday and well, just make I mean, it happen. Like I, I, sp I spent the weekend on the lake. I deserve a break from the break. I mean, come on, man. I can't, you can't expect me to roll in Tuesday morning, 8 a.m., ready and, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Dude, come on now. So, sometimes you actually do need a, a, a vacation from your vacation. You just roll in, you're like, oh, shit, what The way happened? you do vacation, Greg, yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> By the way, Heather Hermes is watching. Heather, what's up? We need to get you on the show. We were supposed to get you on the show, like, last year, and somebody dropped the ball. I won't say me because it totally was. But anyway, um, you so Heather's watching. You ball dropper. Uh, I know. I'm terrible. All right, so the, the, thing, that, the thing that really jumped out about the, uh, the NAR study was the typical realtor only got 12% of their business from repeat clients and customers, and 17% came through referrals. So that's under 30% total from all repeat and referral business, um, which is obviously, I mean, in the age where we can pretty much keep in touch with all of our past clients relatively easily on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, there really is no excuse uh, unless we, as you say, Greg, kick, their, kick them in the shin and call their mom a fat. How are we only <laughs> closing 30% of our deals through a repeat and referral business? Well, it's, it's simple. I mean, it, we're an instant gratification society now. We're a microwave generation. We want things instantly done now. It's not the cultivation of a relationship that has been the foundation of real estate. You know, something that our good friend Hank talks about quite a bit. Gail talks about quite a bit. Anyone that's in kind of that, that, that you know, world over there talks about relationship business. Uh, that's how my father was so successful. Uh, everybody wants a new hot lead now. They don't want it to do anything for it. And they want the person to be ready to buy or sell immediately without any competition. That's why we call it the orphan program. The orphan program is you can go back, and it's something I'm doing right now. You know, coincidentally with Red X, I'm calling through all. I went back 10 years on their on their program, downloaded 10 years of expired pro homes. It, they are the most productive, kind, nice, you know, phone calls I've done in a long period of time. I, I actually have people calling me back and texting me back with responses with things and apologizing they don't want to sell anymore. It's amazing, but it's the, all those people, right? All of those people don't have a, a solid relationship with a real estate agent. Now, uh, some of them will, of course, but if you yeah. can go back and you have the ability to build that relationship, go to coffee, go to lunch, get a beer, you know, build some sort of trust, put them on send out cards, do something along that line to start building that relationship, people won't fall through the cracks anymore. The referrals will start coming through. Nick Sack is what he and I are building together with his app. It's all about being hyper-local, bringing genuine content and information to people so that you stay top of mind. That's why we don't, that's why we close such a low amount of, of deals with follow-ups.
Um, the stat I heard in 14, 2014 was I think 80 plus percent said that they actually would use their real estate agent again to buy or sell. Only 11 percent actually did because the other agents didn't do anything with the follow up. So if you guys are looking for opportunities, you can go create the, the orphan program. Go to your title company if you guys have title in your state uh, and get the ad, get the get the dates of let's say a z one zip code, something simple, uh, and get the anniversary dates of when people bought their home, right? And then send them a send out card and you don't have to know them. Hey, Matt and Julie, you're three obese wood, wood denting, insulin sucking little bolt troll babies. Hey, it's been another year, congratulations. Have you thought about selling this year? Hope you have a good one, enjoy this coupon on me, Matt. Yeah. Right? It's that simple and people just don't do it. And that's why I keep trying to wonder why people don't just buckle down and do like I mean I, I'm yelling at myself right now, you know, because sometimes life gets away from me. And you don't and I don't I can't do three send out cards or two send out cards a day. But if, if that's continuously dripping out six seven hundred cards a year, do you not think that you're going to get a ton of business from just plopping your 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 butt down and writing some cards and saying hi how are you what's going on what's new how can I help? That's it. Seriously, then you can go meet Matt at Starbucks. Go harass him and talk to him as he vigorously types on his computer. I say, that's where the successful people hang out. <laughs> <laughs> Come hang out with me at Starbucks. The successfully high people on, on caffeine, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just, <laughs> I'll have you know, Greg, for the first time ever, I went to Starbucks yesterday afternoon and did not get a coffee. What? Uh, what? I thought the, uh, the Earth access was off. I know. That's exactly. weird. Yeah, you, can't, you came out of your apartment and just fell down because the, the gravitational pull was off. Uh, <laughs> like, I showed I showed up and I just was not feeling it. I uh, I so I got myself a water and a thing of little dark chocolate espresso beans and that. Matt, uh, I uh, I just called WebMD and uh, I have an appointment set for you because I think you're coming down with the, so many different uh, don't, so many different. Don't things. don't worry. Starbucks has a personal concierge team that called me to make sure that I was okay <laughs> because I did not order my customary iced coffee yesterday. There was a, there was a small team. It was a scuffle. They showed up at my house. They wanted to make sure that I was doing well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got the Johnson. We got the Johnson. Yeah, you okay. Yeah, exactly. There's a search party that was sent out. All right. So, uh, so income, exp <laughs> income and expenses. Oh man. Okay. So, 35% of realtors were under like a fixed commission split, less than 100%. Um, about about a quarter of all realtors have like a graduated commission split. That, in other words, that goes up with productivity, which is good. That's what you know teams like Jeff Cohn do. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're not getting something like that, or if you're not under a plan that has a, a cap that goes to 100%. Uh, check into other options. Um, Greg, what's the, uh, g give the quick breakdown on EXP just so people know where EXP relates to the other, where, where does it sit in the ecosystem? In regards to commission, commission splits? splits. Yeah. Uh, we, they start out in 80, 20, uh, but you can either do a full cap of 16,000 or a half cap of $8,000. Um, and it doesn't hinder you in any way, shape or form. You still take part of the stock program. You still get all the education. You still get every benefit and bell and whistle the EXP offers if you decide to do a half cap. If you're on a team and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm just a buyer's agent right now. I don't really, I'm a, I'm a, I don't really want to pay 16 grand. I'll, okay, well, pay, pay $8,000. $8, thousand dollars for the entire year and you're golden and let's say you take off like a bat out of hell and you're crushing it well and you want to go for you know icon status agent well then bump it back up to 16 and you're out the door and you can become an icon agent it's not a big deal you can back that thing forward you can go forward or backward on that thing con uh, continuously until you're comfortable uh, but yeah the thing about this is that I actually would almost do like a 50 50 split with exp if I could just right out of the gate just here's my grant here's my money piss off now I'm going to take 100% from that point forward. I, I, I would seriously, people are like, why oh, would you 50, ever? 50 on your first deal or something like that? A couple deals until, until I paid them my eight, eight or $16,000 just to get it done. I mean, why yeah. not? You got to pay it anyways. Just get it over with. Rip the Band-Aid off. Well, there may, that, may be, that may have something to do with the fact that realtors with two years or less experience had a median gross income of $8,330 for the year. <laughs> yeah, right. that, that, no. It's like, oh, baby. $8,000 cap sounds a lot bigger. Now, granted, I, my, my opinion on that would be a lot. There has to be a lot of part-timers, I would think, <laughs> in there. May, maybe not, but uh, as we know, like the average agent works you know, a good solid 40 hours a week, quote, unquote. I think yeah. that's a – Quote, quote, wink, wink. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's a, uh, I, I think that's an over-reporting. That's a, that's a, that's a rounding error of about 10 to 15 hours a week. I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I worked all day today. What time did you get in the office? Like noon. What time mm -hmm. did you leave? Three. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. That sounds vaguely familiar. Didn't you go to lunch? Well, yeah, but I brought my, you know, I brought a couple agents with me. Had a couple cocktails, you know. Yeah, you're like, oh, cocktails. You're drinking at lunch now. Uh, <laughs> oh, exactly. That's so, uh, so, the, so uh, Yeah, which with the largest expense category for most realtors is vehicle expense. Um, I guess those are for the ones that are not having cocktails at lunches. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, they had the cocktails. Now they're doing repairs on their vehicles. You never know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so uh, the yeah the, the business from repeat and referral clients, man, that's that 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 really jumped out. That that jumped out on the on the show earlier today, because you know, that is just insanity. It is um, insane. And, you know, the yeah. other thing that's just strangely weird is that fifty three percent of all the real real estate agents in the country are affiliated with independent companies. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Is that? Interesting? Uh, I didn't realize it was that high. Um, I mean, yeah. obviously, there's a lot of indie brokers. I get that. And of course, we all we, mostly what we hear is, you know, the KWs, the Century 21s of the world. And it feels like everybody, I throw a rock in any direction and I hit someone that's a licensed KW agent. So I, oh, I get God, that. No. It, may, it may just be the world that we that we run in. But yeah, I was really surprised. Over half of realtors are affiliated with an indie. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's really interesting. I think that will consolidate. Um over over the coming years, I think there's just there's too much technology coming down the pipeline, and it's too hard unless indies form like more societies, coalitions, you know, like like the leading real estate companies of America, like groups like that, to where you can get indies together and go buy technology and give it to your agents. I think the tech is going to push them out. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see yeah. how that works. We also have been uh, companies like Compass that are coming in and literally gobbling up. Everything in their path. They just, I think they just what, purchased what's your, Pacific Union. Pacific Union. Yeah. What's your What's your opinion of Compass? I I don't know what to think of them, but I I know people that think very highly of them. And one of my clients was with Conlon Christie's, and his Christie's franchise got bought out by Compass, so he's now a Compass agent. Like surprise. Yeah. Welcome to the office. You're now a Compass agent. Yeah, like, I oh, am. Okay. <laughs> That's new. Oh. Yeah. So what's uh, what's what's Compass doing in your area? What what is catching your eye? They're buying people. They're straight up buying people, and not like a commodity buying them. Like yeah. this is what they're doing. If you have a somewhat of a good performance, they'll say, "Matt, I want you to work with us. I will give you a million dollars to come work with us." No joke. But here's the caveat: you have a contract that's ironclad for the next ten years. So basically, mm-hmm. they're giving you a hundred thousand dollars every year for marketing or whatever else you want it to be for. But you're locked in for ten years and i'm like wow and my, my my business partner goes dude i'll go to compass for a million bucks and i turn to chris and i'm like hey bro that means like you're almost 50 you'll be 60 when you get out of there he's like whoa man why you gotta be so rude <laughs> I'm like well you are gonna be 60 man it's 10 years so you'll figure uh what do you think about can i'm gonna be 40 and i mean i would have to be at that company for another i'd, I'd get out of there at 50 it's like a freaking prison prison sentence like i'm yeah, um, just like doing time yeah, Ooh. you say kid. Uh, I said I said it's like having a kid. Yeah. Um, so uh, so one of the other stats was the uh, the median tenure for realtors with the current firm was four years, and that's that's been consistent. So yeah, so basically Compass is buying people out for you know trying to get them for ten years because they're looking at the numbers going most people are here for four. Yeah. So how about we not do that? Um, yeah, exactly. And I, yeah, which, it'll be interesting which just to see. Showing. There's there's a lot of moving around. For, for the wrong reasons, is my opinion. Oh, well, there, there were those, there's moving around all the time for dumb, silly little things. I mean, I've had yeah. people come in and come out of our EXP line and team mm-hmm. uh, because they woke up one day and they're like, ah, shit, I want an office. I'm like, you want commutes? You want to have to answer to a boss every day? This is something you uh, uh, strive for? I or two, yeah. You are crazy, sir. Um, but other agents just need it for whatever reason. But I mean, it's people hop around and then they feel guilty because oh my god, I'm hopping around everywhere. It's like, yeah, man, you know, find a you know, find a community, find a tribe that you like and stick with it. Mm-hmm. End of story. Yeah, there's there's a good concept in the book Scale. Um, I did a little video training on here. I think it was a couple weeks ago. It was when David Finkel's episode of UX came out, and he talks about change and momentum and really? how. Yeah, like it, like those two things are always kind of in this little yin yang of of tension, right? Because you you, yeah. know, you know you want to change, you want to take advantage of the shifting market, you want to take advantage of changing demand, you want to you want to pivot when you need to, uh, and sometimes that means getting into a different business, sometimes it means appealing to different types of clients. Um, you know, in the last downturn, it meant like learning REOs and bank yeah. stuff versus just re- straight up residential. So, so like a, real estate is not immune to this. It just has a little different form in our little ecosystem that we run in. 
And uh, he points out that, look, most of the success is in the building of the momentum. Yeah. So you want to get as much momentum as you possibly can because that pushes things forward and makes things easier. Um, you know, success breeds success and all this stuff. The more that we change, like we should only change when it's for really, really good strategic reasons because change breaks momentum. Yeah. And so the only time change is worth it is when change gets us into something else that allows us to build momentum in an area that's going to pay off in a big way. A big so they way. have very intelligent decisions. And I think there's a lot of people that switch brokerages for, like you said, either dumb reasons, small reasons, or just the wrong reasons. They're thinking that that's going to fix the problem when a lot of times the problem is just they're not having enough conversations with people who can buy and sell real estate. Yeah, it, it's a simple thing. You just go out the door, hand out 25. If you have 25 conversations a day, it, you're, you're good. I mean, good conversations, just do it every single day, 25 of them, hand out your card and keep moving forward. People always, like, the only reason Matt, well, I really changed brokerages over to EXP, twofold. One, we needed to figure out, um, you know, a way to monetize the podcast and kind of you and I always want to do something with coaching and training on team and everything else. Also, the reason why we left Rockcliffe, or my, my past brokerage, is because it became so toxic in the office environment that it was unbearable. And I, and I told Hank, my, 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 uh, my, my sponsor for EXP, I pretty much told him to go fuck off. I'm like, dude, I'm not leaving. I love my people. I've been with these people for almost 18 years at that point. Like, this was my work family. I, mean, I knew everything about them. They knew everything about me. I didn't want to change. But I we shifted because we had to. A lot of people shift because they think the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. When, you, when in reality, you need to start watering the grass you're standing on, not go looking for a greener patch. Because you yeah. know what? All the shit that you don't you don't like is coming right with you to the next brokerage. Okay? <laughs> That's right. Wherever you are, new. there you are. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody wants to admit that. Like, no, man, the, this new place can be so much better. No, fucker, it's not. It's going to be the exact same way because you aren't going to change. So stop shifting around and just get to freaking work. That's yeah. all it takes. Yeah. But that's too logical, Matt. That is too logical. Well, and, and it goes back to the idea of focus, right? It's 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 fun to think about change, and it's fun to think about the possibilities and things like that. Um, but the bottom line is, yeah, like most of the success is in doing the same things over and over again to the point where they really start to pay off. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a stat here that says like the, the agents with 16 years or more experience, their median gross income was almost 80 grand. Yeah. Well, why do you think that is? Uh, I guarantee a lot of them are not super sharp marketers. It's because they're just in the game. They manage to stay in the game, and you build yeah. up relationships over the course of 15, 16 years, just like you have, Greg. And, of course, you built up a skill set that you can fall back on, too, a skill set mm -hmm. to build new relationships from scratch, from cold, so right. you, you're even further along. Um, but, you know, I mean, even, even someone like your dad who would rather maybe not do that and built his reputation on door knocking and now can really allow people to kind of call him and say, hey, come list my home – like that comes with time and you got to hang yes. in there long enough to build up that kind of momentum to the point where you have that database of people who look at you the way that they, that your database looks at your dad. A hundred percent. You know, I've one of the things that I, I know to be true and sometimes it sucks that this is a reality of real estate, but the people you meet today are the people you'll be doing business with tomorrow, AKA build the, build the relationships, build your pipeline, and then keep that building every single day all of a sudden they'll start popping out and they'll, start, they'll call you up and hey can you list my house can i see this house you know can i do kind of buy an investment property whatever it is but it's you know it's time on task 100 percent of the thing 100 percent, no matter what nothing if you think in real estate you might find a unicorn every once in a blue moon that are actually going to do something right now when you contact them but it's the nurturing and it's the follow-up and it's the persistence and it's the consistency so, so there's persistence and consistence. Um, my coaching client, I got a call with him, Ryan, dude, knuckles to you, boom, drop mic for you and for you and Monica. Um, dude, they we had they, they hit twenty one million dollars last year. That was their volume. They just broke twenty one million dollars this weekend based on our coaching that we've been working on together with them. And we got him into a whole new headspace. Talking to him now versus eight months ago, he's a different human. It's, a, it's, it's awesome to watch the transformation. He was all like down in the dumps, all bah humbugs. Oh, I've never done this, blah, 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 yakety schmack bullshit. I actually mm -hmm. kept his two first checks to me. I kept them and didn't cash them because I wanted to fire him as a client because <laughs> he wasn't listening to me. And then he started listening and he started transforming and he started reading the books and doing the things, you know, the different tasks I was telling him to do. And now, dude, 
he's on freaking fire. And we have goals. We have the Rolex Club, and we have the third, you know, the three zero club. And we're gonna hit those hit those milestones this year. But it's all because he took the, the you know the, took the initiative and went time on task, did his jobs every single day. We restructured it, you know his 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 daily calendar, got his head screwed on straight. Now he's crushing heads. He's they are killing it this That's year awesome. in business. And then I scared them. I scared them this morning. I'm like, so, so we're gonna do 40 million next year? He's like, whoa, 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 dude. We're just going for 30 this year. I'm like, yeah, but your life's still cool. What's the problem? I know that, that's a that's a weird thing. I th I think that has to do with people's perception of, I guess not not understanding leverage and not understanding how to get things done through other people. Um, yeah. Why why wouldn't you want to do serve another 10 or 20 clients? Because he shouldn't take more hours in the day. Shouldn't take more hours in the day. Let's put it that way. Right. So he was afraid of the quality of life that it would go down. And yeah, so of his wife and I browbeat him religiously uh, until he succumbed. And now I talked to him today. I'm like, dude, did it, does it, did it feel weird to hit this mile marker? Did your life change in any negative way? He's like, mm. no, no, not at all. I'm like, so why are you saying no to 40 then? If your life and you know, the processes and everything else is in place, why would you not want to stretch and make more of that money for your, for your new son? They have a six month old, by the way, they did this all with a brand new, brand new, brand new baby. Good um, yeah. Whew, that's that's our early insane. mornings. And that, Amy, Amy Brokhammer is watching and says, yakety schmack. Yakety schmack. <laughs> What up, Amy B? I love that. Oh, uh, that's funny. Okay, and there's there's one question, one question I should say that I did want to close out on because it's really good. Before we do that, Greg, how do people connect with you, and and why should they connect with you? I'm a lovable teddy bear, buddy. Um, uh, so guys, let's talk EXP. Let's talk about real estate. Let's talk about the shift. I mean, that's going to that's coming down the pipe. It, this industry. Let's say you don't move right don't change brokerages well there you are going to be left in the wake of where this where this business is going and I, if someone had given me the opportunity 18 years ago to be like hey come join this other company this new thing called exp and you can get stocks and you can get passive income and you can go ahead and get 100 percent on your commissions if you just do x y and z Honestly, dude, I would have millions and millions and millions of dollars in the bank because 18 years of compounding of growing my team, I mean, I, there would be a whole new wealth bracket that I'd be ach ach achieving here. So if you guys are interested in seeing where this business goes, because it's not, it's not going to be the same in 18 years. It's not going to be the same in three years. It's sure as shit not going to be the same in five years. Yeah. So go to bookmcdaniel.com. Again, it's bookmcdaniel.com. Let's talk for 30 minutes. I do, I do want, if you guys are interested in the idea, Book a call, let's have a combo, and we'll move on from there. Cool, love it. All right, and then for the show, make sure to go to Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, all that good stuff. Make sure to subscribe to the show, leave us a rating or review. If there is a particular guest episode where you really like them, uh, make sure to give them a uh, public shout out when you leave your review on iTunes. When it gets mm -hmm. to triple digits on the reviews, because we are horrible about asking for reviews, so we'd love <laughs> yes, you to go and leave a nice rating oh, and review on iTunes. Uh, so let's uh, let's finish out with the question. This is from Melanie, who's watching with us live. She says, "How do you feel about leaving a family business?" Mm, I Melanie, this is something that you've uh, you know, uh, like you're you're in a family business. I, I've never been in a family business, so of course my I have a little bit different perspective. But Greg, you'd probably be more much more sensitive than I would. What would your what would your criteria be for when it's how do you know it's time to leave a family business? So I've had this discussion in the past with my team, um, and when I made the shift from, we we're going to go from Rockcliffe to EXP, um, I just had to come to a realization like this, is, I love my family, I want to work with my family, but if they don't want to work with me and they don't want to go the direction I'm going, then you have to be okay to part ways. And I, it took me a long time to come to that realization, like being comfortable with having that conversation with Terry, with Chris, with my mom, with Eileen and everything else, because that's what I've known in my business life. It's a, I've worked with these people my entire life in business. And so, in, in, at least in my career, although obviously other jobs in my life as well, but... Right. I don't know, you, just, you know, Melanie, you just have to know that it's going to be the right thing for you at the end of the day. Pros, cons, you know, what's going to make the most sense for you? And then run the numbers, look at it with zero emotion, and then move on from there. Either you're going to do it or you're not. I mean, there are always shifts in life. And there may be another shift for me coming down the pipe relatively soon. Not 100% sure, but you know, there's going to be something there that I might need to make another step myself. You never know. But I've come to that realization that okay, fuck, this is really going to suck probably. But 
all right, let's let's look at it and make a next step because I don't if I if I don't want to be where I am today in one year, then you something has to change, right? So from you, Melanie, if you want something to shift in your life, you've got to have that real conversation with you or your husband or boyfriend or family or whoever you need to consult in your life, significant other, um, and say, okay, you know, if we take X action, Y is going to be our result. Are we cool with Y being the result? Yes, no. And then jump. Yeah. yeah that's, as e that's as easy and as hard as it is right there. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it's definitely, it's emotionally harder than intellectually harder. Um, and and I, I can say that having, mm -hmm. A, left my dad's church at the age of 21, a church True. we started together, and two, leaving my old agency and my mentor and my comfort zone to go out on my own. And so I've, I've you know, like I've been through that experience a couple of times. Um, it's not fun, but I would say this, if it's not, if it's not an agreement that you would enter into with a complete stranger, why would you let it be that way with family? Yep. 100%. You know, 100%. You, especially if it, especially if it restricts you from becoming the person that you want to become mm -hmm. the financial stuff. Like if it's just a discomfort with negotiation, talk to someone that can help you with the negotiation part. Cause I, I think that's a lot of what goes on with people in family businesses is they just, they're uncomfortable with the negotiation process. Like, Hey, <clears throat> we are splitting expenses and splitting this and splitting this and splitting the commissions and yada, yada. And now your work level is half of what mine is, or mm -hmm. you're not doing this or you're not doing that. I mean, Greg, we've done that with our own partnership. Like we, mm -hmm. you know, initially we were both all in and there was no question of whether we were putting in the same amount of time that fluctuates. Mm -hmm. If one of us had gotten married, and had a kid, Ugh. like our participation in the show would have dropped. And guess what? Then one person is putting more work in than the other, but then we're splitting the proceeds 50-50. Like all these weird partnership deals we get in, get ourselves into are n typically not good. They, yeah. they sound awesome, and then they end up working out not well because they don't, they don't take just life. Like life changes, and it, it, yeah. it changes how much we can really pour into the business. And so, and Melanie says, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that she's still watching and caught oh, cool. the hand. So yeah, I mean, if it if it if it restricts the person you want to become, open the negotiation. It's just a negotiation to to start talking about what it looks like. Can can we negotiate something that gives me the freedom to be who I want to be and grow the business that I want to grow within the structure? Or if it just doesn't work, you go your separate ways. Um, uh, the book here that's sitting off to my left, managing the professional service firm. Um, he talks about how a lot of people like law firms and accounting firms and these like high powered firms would bring him in to work with their executive leadership team. And he said he would he would tell them like, hey, be careful, because about 40 or 50 percent of the time that I come in and really dig in and work with the leadership team, it, it gets revealed that one or more of the partners need to go their separate ways mm -hmm. because you're trying to trying to build a business where people who shouldn't be in business together have been in business together and the process of figuring it out reveals that you shouldn't be in business together. Like you should go do your Big own time. separate thing and be happy. Yeah, no, it's totally true. It's totally true. And, you know, th th thankfully you and I have a very good working relationship partnership. I mean, it's you, we each do other things the other person doesn't want or can't, can't do or I, vice versa. Um, and we talk, we hacked this out, like hashed this out way before. And when we, even before we even became officially partners on the, on stuff, we're like, okay, what do you want out of this? What do I want out of this? What's going to break? The, what, what can you do? What can you not do? Okay. Are you cool with this? Are you cool with that? Yes. Okay, cool. So we knew the playing field before we even stepped on to, you know, stepped out there to, you know, to really see what we can do together. And, you know, I've had some very, very tough, hard hitting conversations in the last week or two. And they were brutal conversations to have. Um, but they were so, you know, I was so grateful to have them because at the end of the day, when the conversation was done, it's like, oh, Whew, that's out in the air. All right, good. Now we can move forward to the next topic. Yeah. Um, and it, you, you will be scared of having those conversations, and it's okay to be scared. But just like Matt, like you were saying, Matt, like it's just a negotiation. Get into the talks. Just see what's going on. They might feel the same way. They might feel exactly the same way. But yeah. if you don't take action, it will fester and get worse and worse and worse and worse until it explodes, and it can damage or even destroy a relationship. Yeah. Might as well head off at the pass. Yeah, especially with the family business, you know. Yeah. That, I mean, that's what it did for for me and my family with the church that that we started way back in the day. It created a wedge between us. We're closer today than we ever have been, and 
because because we're not in business together or, or yeah. in leadership together trying to build something together like that that did more harm than good <laughs> um so I, I i'm the more the, the longer i've been in business and the more stuff that i've tried you know collaborations and joint ventures and stuff like that the more firmly i've come to believe that partnerships are most of the time a bad idea and a temporary band-aid trying to get somebody else to come in and bring in some skill, something you don't want to do that you think they're going to bring into the, to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Nick Sackett says, look at what, uh, look at what happened to Orange County choppers. Those guys don't even talk at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what happened to my dad and I, we didn't talk for the better part of two years after that. Yeah. And same it, thing. It, Go ahead. Yeah. Same thing happened to me and my dad and my brother when we were doing yeah. our, their first high tech company, he, it got oh. so bad, so destructive that my brother moved out of state. That's why he moved. I didn't why, know that. That's why he moved. Wow. It got that bad and they didn't talk yeah. for two years. And I told him, I, I'm like, it's going to be 12 to 24 months minimum until they start talking again. And it was, and now they're fine. They're back in business yeah. together and everything's rosy and, and awesome, but they had to reestablish the, 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 the roles. Like yeah. I'm doing this, you're doing that. No blurring of lines, black and white. Yeah. And that, that's a, what they've been able to do. That's why they've been successful with it. Um, yeah. And I think there's, there's something to be said for there. There's a lot of ways to skin the cat. There, there's why a are we lot skinning of ways cats? to get, why can we skin dogs? Are, first of all, why can um, we skin dogs? <laughs> yeah, no. uh, what I mean is this, if you, if you have something where you want to get into partnership with somebody and you have the urge to like start something where you're 50, 50 partners, most likely there's some, most likely somebody, one of those two people, their heart isn't it more than the other, for one. Number two, most likely whoever's heart isn't it, isn't it the most should be the leader. And then you work out some other rev share, profit share arrangement where you pay a percentage or whatever. Instead of just paying 50%, just work out an arrangement where they can bring their skill set, they bring what they want, they help build it and yada yada in exchange for a profit share or rev share or something like that instead of a partnership like an equity partnership in the business to me those those are much more likely to work out long term yeah and everybody needs to get needs needs to figure out what works best for you guys i mean do you want to partners up i mean i have matt you're one of my partners uh mm -hmm. tiffany mcfarland she's one of my partners on on the radio show on kgo uh and what we're growing there and then my dad and chris and they're, they're my partners on another one so i have three sets of partners and i really looked at each one of those people and i'm like okay do i want to actually be in partnership with you yeah. Each one of those groups, I said absolutely because there's certain skill sets and certain personalities that they, they jive well. So mm. I was just be say, careful. I, I was waiting for you to say personalities that you didn't have, and I was going to correct you by saying <laughs> that you'd have all of them. But you did not go the way that I wanted that to go. But let's uh, <laughs> let's wrap things up. Melanie, that was an awesome question, by the way, and I'm glad she got a chance to ask it. And she's actually uh, since moved on to EXP, apparently. So she's she has left. Where's the call, business. girl? What's up, Nicole? I know. I Melanie, know. go like this. Bad Come on. Melanie. Bad exactly. Melanie. <laughs> exactly. If you guys are thinking about cha changing brokerages, as long as it's for the right reasons, make sure to grab a, a time on Greg's calendar because yes. if you are looking to change for the right reasons in the sense that you want to make more money, you want to you want to have better access to technology, you want access to me and Greg because you feel like you resonate with us and our message and you want freedom in your business and you feel like we can potentially help you get there, with personal conversations and coaching and our training products and all of our programs and all that stuff. Like if it's for those reasons, reach out to Greg and, yes. uh, and book a time at bookmcdaniel.com. Or so. if you guys just want to get Matt's personal cell phone number, join EXP and I'll be happy to provide it for you. <laughs> sure. He's giving me a dead look. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So with that being said, Greg, let's, let's put a nice, uh, what shall we, what shall we do here? What shall we do? Oh, we've dude. done we've done so many colors and bows to tie upon our episodes. I have to come up with something really good. So I'm gonna go with a natural maple. Just that, mm, <laughs> like the, the same color as my drum set and the eight string bass that's sitting over there. Natural maple colored bow, a nice light, light, light yellow. I was feeling a natural na natural ma maple, so you must have read my mind today. I must have. <laughs> No. <laughs> All right. So we're putting a, a natural maple uh, bow on this, whatever that's going to look like. I'm sure that's a very uh, energizing color. Uh, but you guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, go to iTunes. Give us a five-star review if you like what we're doing. Share this podcast to people that might need to hear this. Um, and we love you. That's why we come and bring cool guests. Not today. We're just me and Matt uh, talking as my voice cracks like a 12-year-old girl. Um, but um, love you. You guys are amazing. Rock out. I love you guys. Peace out, ninjas. We go.